word. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verses 25 through 29. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to have entered into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went. And he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent and he went in to tarry with them now you're going to have to look over me and many of you tonight will have to google this later but when I was a little boy growing up there was an old commercial about a man's aftershave men in skin bracer and the man in the commercial would take the uh, aftershave and put it in his hand that was supposed to awaken him to invigorate him and to prepare him for the day once he had that aftershave in his hand he'd slap himself on both sides of his face and usually a smile would come on or a serious look and he'd look at the camera and say thanks I needed that. Luke's Gospel chapter 24, Jesus has died and risen from the grave. The word has gotten out that he is not in the tomb, that the tomb is empty. As we come to this part of Luke 24, we meet two disciples. Now I'm going to just go ahead and tell you, in my personal opinion, I believe it is Cleopas and his wife. They're done. Things have not went like they thought it would. This following Jesus hadn't worked out and they've come to the place and said we're done. They're now distancing themselves from Jerusalem. They're headed home to a village called Emmaus. Their heads are down. They're dragging. They got to put you might well nod your head up and down. Sound like the church in the day in which we live. I'm amazed as I travel up and down the road preaching a different church every week how many of God's people seem to be distancing themselves from the true things of God uh, seem to always be down, seem to always be defeated, seem to always have a, a, a downward look about everything. But I'm glad, hallelujah, if you read the opening verses of this story, though they're distancing themselves, though they're dragging themselves, can you almost see it's just a work to take another step. Uh, but you know what happens in the middle of their defeat, in the middle of their darkness, in the middle of their depression I'm glad that the Lord Jesus himself uh, comes along and joins up with them and starts walking with them he talks with them he listens to everything they got aren't you glad hallelujah when in the poop slip whiny mood the Lord doesn't get mad at you he just lets you spill your guts he just lets you tell everything and he walks along with them I mean he even asks them what things are you talking about and they like are you a stranger? Lord, no, I'm not a stranger. But I'll walk with you like I am one. Sometime when you can't feel him. Sometime when you can't find him. You just have to faith him. Because I promise you on the authority of his own word uh, that he is with us no matter when we up or down. No matter when we feel like a winner or act like a loser. I'm glad the Lord is with us. But when we get to these verses that we read tonight, when I read them, they were like a double slap in the face. And as I began to study them, I looked up to heaven and said, thanks, I needed that. And for a few minutes tonight, I want to preach on that thought. Thanks. I needed that. In verse number 25, we'll see that I say thanks. I needed that rebuke. Look at verse 25. Now they done told him everything that they thought was going on. They done give him the whole low down and the skinny. And Jesus says unto them, Oh, 
fools. The first rebuke here is he rebukes them concerning their thinking. He says you've not put any thought into this. You've not used your brain power. You better remember tonight that whatsoever a man thinketh in his heart so is he. Paul exhorted us to uh, renew our mind. Be transformed uh, by the renewing of their mind. Don't let the devil, don't let the flesh, don't let the world tell you how you supposed to think. Uh, I'm telling you our problem in this day is we've let some outsider come in and tell us how we ought to think and they got our thinking all messed up and we're not using our brain anymore. I'm talking about born again blood washed saved by grace through faith Christians we're not thinking right anymore can you imagine that in so called evangelical churches now 57% of folks who believe Jesus is the savior of the world now think there may be more than one way to get to heaven could you imagine that now we think that maybe if you're a good person that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe our thinking's all messed up they said Jesus is supposed now think about it they said now some of them came from the tomb and said it was empty even the apostle Peter went and checked it out and the body's not there and still yet they thought it's not worked like, we should, like it should have and Jesus says to them now I'm not going to tell you exactly what he calls them here when he says fools but he's basically saying thoughtless and it's not that you don't have the ability it's not that you don't understand but it's that you've not stopped and said aren't we living in a world uh, that's not using their brain at all we just fall for every wind of doctrine now let me just go ahead and tell you this I ain't a coming under the umbrella of love I ain't a going along to get along I know I'm an old dinosaur and I'm not a step of what's going on uh, but I still think in my heart that God meant what he said uh, when he said what he did uh, and he didn't change it cause times changed uh, he didn't change it cause science changed uh, he didn't change it because uh, knowledge changed uh, I still believe God meant what he said uh, I still believe this book is true uh, no matter what anybody says no matter what anybody does I'll not give up my Bible I'll not turn back on what we stand for they say well you don't know you, you're not thinking right no brother you're not thinking right and Jesus said to them oh fools he rebuked them concerning their thinking then he says and see when your thinking gets wrong and's a conjunction word links them two thoughts together one goes with the other he said oh fools and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken not only did he rebuke them on their thinking but he rebuked them on their trusting see they were trusting in what they thought doesn't that sound like the church in our day well I think what we ought to do and I think what we ought to do but Jesus said how slow of heart you are to just believe the book you've been carrying around the book you said you've been reading the book you've been teaching in Sunday school class these are disciples of the Lord Jesus these are followers of him these folks have left all to be with Jesus and now they won't even believe this book we live in a day where preachers who stand in the pulpit will not believe this book hold on I come to pick a little bird it's under my saddle anyway we live in a day where now if a preacher's believed something 40 years and I'm talking about an independent fundamental King James Bible only walk right keep it tight spit white and drank spite preacher if he's preached it 40 years wrong and you show him according to the words of the Bible that it's wrong guess what he ain't a changing now but I'm here to tell you Jesus rebuked them because he said the scriptures have said it you've read it you heard what the prophet said and you still will not believe oh God help us to get back to not listening to what Fox News said or what the government said or what the latest conspiracy theory is uh, but to anchor my soul on in and on uh, the word of God uh, not be slow to believe it be fast to believe the word of God isn't it amazing how fast we are to believe the word of the flesh or the word of that devil we immediately believe what he said and slow he's rebuking them I don't know about you but every once in a while I need a rebuke 
Now, as many of you know, my dad wasn't a preacher. He was old mean as a rattlesnake, hard-headed, hard-nosed, <coughs> ill all the time, mad at the world. Hated everybody. And hated them all equal. They had him, called him a racist one time, and he made the statement, Richard Weaver cannot be a racist because I hate everybody. And I hate them all equal. They printed in our local paper, one of my smart aleck teachers. Now, I'm not a smart aleck in it. Well, I'm trying not to be a smart aleck in it. Pray for me, I'm really working on it. But I really was bad when I was young. She stood me up in front of the class and read that little article to me and said, uh, Mr. Weaver, that's your daddy? I said, it is. Said uh, He said he cannot be a racist because he hates everybody and he hates them all equal. What do you think about that? I said, well, I'll tell you what I think about it. I am his firstborn child. I am his only son. I am his legacy. I am the carry on of his name. And he hates me. <laughs> so I don't have any problem believing that he hates you the same amount that he hates me. And I sat down. I'm here to tell you that my daddy believed that. I, I, I'm not going to say it like a, uh, I want to, but I'll try to soften it up just a little bit. He believed that every once in a while his son needed a good stiff kick in the backside uh, and he wasn't ashamed to give me one. Uh, and he, he, he used to tell me, now I'm going to go ahead and tell you so y'all don't think I was abused. He said, if I kick you forward with my toes of my shoe, that's abuse. But if I turn my foot sideways, that's just to put a little giddy up in your step. That's just to put a little, uh, you know, to get you straight, thinking straight again. I tell you what we need. We want revival. We need the Holy Ghost to come along uh, and give us a little rebuke, uh, give us a little slap on each side of our face, awaken us to the truth of the Word of God. Uh, don't call 1-800-PSYCHIC. Don't call somebody else and ask them what they think about it. Find out what God said about it. Plant your feet and stand on it. No matter what anybody says, no matter what anybody does, God help us not to be slow of heart to believe what the word of God says. Thanks, I needed that, a rebuke. As we come to verse 26 and 27, I want you to see I needed that. I needed that reminder. Look what Jesus says. He said, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? See, he reminds us that there is an order to Christianity. Jesus does everything decent and in order. See, he's got to suffer before he can rule in his kingdom. You and I as God's people may weep all night. You gotta weep all night. But joy comes in the morning. You gotta sow before you can reap. If you wanna live, you have to die. If you wanna find your life, you first have to lose it. If you wanna have it all, you have to give it all up. If you wanna be first, you have to be last. If you wanna live, you have to die. If you wanna reign with him, first you have to to suffer with him. There is a divine order. I know, I know when the hard times come, when the trials come, uh, we're the first ones that want to throw up our hands uh, just like they did. The craziest thoughts will go through your mind uh, and you'll be ready to quit, finish, wave the white flag. But Jesus Christ said, uh, I not only came to save sinners, but I came to set up a divine order to be an example. If Christ must suffer first, and then enter into his glory there's no ascension without resurrection there's no resurrection without death if you want to be resurrected guess what you got to die and if you want to be exalted you have to be a base you have to be humbled and he sets that direct or that order of Christianity sometimes it looks like we're losing we never lose it the Lord's never losing. Sometimes if you look in the world now, it looks like he's losing. But it is the divine order. If we want all the time to see the Lord, I, I heard a preacher say this, it's not like the, uh, the one religious group. We don't go up and make a wish and rub our Lord's belly. We don't, 
you'll have to Google this. We don't ring a big gong in the house and expect the Lord to step up and say, you rang and do everything that, matter of fact, Simon Peter said after you've suffered a while then that is the divine order I don't like it no more than you do but if Jesus went through it if Jesus established it if Jesus said this is the way what's the Bible he said ought not Christ uh, the prophets have said uh, from the beginning of time uh, from the first writings of Moses when he said that the serpent would bruise his heel uh, and he would bruise his head suffering and then glory look like defeat and then the victory shines through there is a divine order to Christianity oh God remind us tonight you say you don't know what I'm going through I know that you got to walk through the valley to get to the next mountain you got to sail across the stormy sea to get to the other side it's just the order of Christianity and then watch this in verse 27 he said in beginning at Moses <coughs> and all the prophets if you go over later in the text you'll find out he throwed in the Psalms he said expounded in all the could you imagine that could you imagine walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus was approximately seven and a half miles and Jesus walked with them for about seven miles and started at Moses. Maybe he started over there at Adam and Eve. Had seen, oh, Adam had sinned and plunged us. And all of a sudden they had sco- coats of skin. Where did they get to him from that first sacrifice? Moses had talked about a prophet that would come. Uh, and he said, hear him. Listen to him. That's the one you're looking for. Moses had told, recounted how they had took that lamb and slayed that lamb and put his blood on the doorpost. And the, I just got to say this. The death angel said when I see the blood he didn't say I'm going to stop at every house and open the door and look in to see who's worthy he said all I all I got to see is the blood that'll be good enough I'm not weighing you in the balances when I see his blood that's good enough for me I'll pass could you imagine when there's anointing Aaron Jesus was our high priest touched with the feelings of our infirmities Daniel in his prophecy basically pinpointed the very day that Messiah would come the very day that he would die and all through the Psalms all through can you imagine Jesus walking along with you expounding Isaiah 53 Psalm 22 and telling you what he had just suffered for you glory to God I don't know if that's helping you tonight but it's helping me and what he is reminding me of is not only is an order to Christianity but there is an object if you will not only is there a principle but there is a person and his name is Jesus Christ he said he expounded he opened up he made known he revealed unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself Christianity is not about you and it's not about me it is about our Savior we I'm telling you salvation is not about you it's all about him salvation is of the Lord our service is not about you it is a man I'm going to tell you I'm sick and tired and fed up in my eyebrows of folks think they're somebody because God chose to put her, his hand on them and use them in a certain way it ain't about the preacher it ain't about the pastor it's not about the good singer it's about him he is the person of Christianity he is the object he's the only one that we should be after he's the only one that we should seek he's the only one that we should glorify and if we're ever going to have revival we'll have to get our eyes off what we think we'll have to believe what he said and we'll have to focus on him he is the object of our salvation he's the person the object of our service he's the object of our satisfaction see I like to say it like this I actually borrowed uh, this statement I was growing up in church we had a 
dear man of God, name was T.G. Davis. He coined this phrase. Jesus saves and satisfies. He'd answer the phone that way. You young folk might not know this, but there's a time we didn't carry our phones around in our pocket. They sat on a table. I, had, I remember before you could hang them on the wall, and what you'd do is you'd buy about a 40-foot cord that plugged into the receiver part and into the box that worked the phone and dialed it like this. That way you could go get some privacy in another room and shut the door. <coughs> yeah, I, I, I know I'm a dinosaur, but I'm going to tell you this. I'm enjoying getting old. I, I, I like it. I don't like the pain that comes with it. Somebody said, well, hard work won't kill you. I worked like a dog for 40, uh, 35 years, and uh, I loaded trucks and moved this and carried that and drove this and did that, and it didn't kill me. They were right, but it sure make my hands sore in the morning and my knees. Like, anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm telling you that we've got to get back to the object, to the person of our salvation. We cannot be uh, just because the times change, just because we modernize. It is not about your gifts. It is not about your ability. It is not about your troubles. It is not about your trials. It is all about him. The writer said, looking unto Jesus, our focus must be, if we're going to have revival, we've got to look away from everything else and look toward him. He's the only one that matters. He's the only one that counts. He's the only one that's important. Amen. Thanks, I needed that. A rebuke, a reminder. Verse 29, I'm finished. Thanks, I needed that, a revival. Watch what he says. Now I'm going to read verse 28. The walk's almost over. They drew nigh unto the village of Emmaus. Whether they went, that's where they were going. He would have gone farther. Act like he's going to keep going. Look at verse. But the revival had already got stirred up in their heart. If you go back and read the earlier verses, they're talking about they tell Jesus, are you a stranger? Have you not heard what's been going on? We thought he was our Messiah. We thought he was going to see what they actually thought was he's going to set up his kingdom. He is going to overthrow Rome and he's going to let the Israelites, the Jews, rule the whole world and he's going to sit on the throne. And they said, we believed all that. And now he's dead and it's been three days. Oh, I know them women. They said that he's alive. And Simon Peter and John went down there and checked the grave, the tomb, and it's empty. Still ain't enough. Some of us will never have revival because it just seems like the Lord never gives us enough. Well, I know he did that, but I, when I pastored, I, I pastored several of these. I call them billy goat Christians. They butt everything. Well, I know that probably be best, but I know the Lord said that, but this is what they're doing. Uh, it just ain't working out like I thought it was. It just ain't going. But when they got near home, they got right there at the house, something had changed. Hallelujah. You may have drug in here tonight. You're thinking all out of whack. Your trust, your faith waning in the Lord Jesus. Uh, but right here tonight, we can have revival. Let me say this. We're so caught up in a rushing wind uh, or thunder and lightning or the building shaking and the earth quaking. But you may sit like a knot on the log. You may come and leave all week, but you ain't a hindering me. I come to get everything God has from me. I come to get in on everything he wants. I come to wait out in the deep water. Hallelujah. I want to get in over my head. I don't know if you want it. I want it. I don't know if you'll get it, but I came expecting God to stir up revival in my soul and and I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to have it. No matter what you do. No matter what you think. No matter what you say. All I can say is come on. Let's get in the deep water together. Hallelujah. As he used to say. Come on in. The water's fine out here. But watch what happens. And I'm finished. Verse 29. He said. In verse 29. <coughs> but they. Constrained him. 
That word constrain means to compel. It means to compel with force. When in Matthew's gospel, Jesus constrained his disciples to get in the ship, knowing they were going to sail into a storm. I use this. We verse country dictionary biblical words say that constrained means they grabbed him by the nap. I know I'm married to a school teacher. I know it's actually nape, but where I'm from, we call it the nap of the neck. He, gra he grabbed them by the nap of the neck and the seat of the britches and put them on the ship. And what had happened? Something had happened in this seven mile journey. They had come down. They left Jerusalem with the lips dragging. Their shoulders sloped over this small step. Uh, uh, one right just drudgingly along. Uh, but by the time they got to their house, they reached out and grabbed a hold of them and said, no, uh, don't leave now. Don't go on now. Come on in here. Don't leave. I tell you what we need a revival of. We need a revival of commitment to his person. We need to get hungry and thirsty for him. No matter what happens at work, no matter what happens at school, no matter what's happening during the days of this week, we ought to get up in the morning, we ought to go to our job, we ought to come to the house of God, and we ought to lay hold on him and say, no, don't go any farther. No, don't stop talking to me now. Don't stop blessing me now. Don't stop walking with me now. They said, come on into our house. Come on in here and stay. They constrained him. They, I believe they laid hands on him. Whoa, no. No, don't leave now. It's just getting good. A revival of commitment to his person. Then what's this? They said to him, abide with us. That word abide in Weaver's Country Dictionary means to come in, take up residence, and never leave again. They really don't know yet that it's Jesus. They just know that he's a saying and he's a doing and he's a working and they don't want him to ever leave. That word abide means to stay forever. He said come in our house and just stay with us. Don't worry about anything. Oh God help us to get so excited about him that we want him to be at our house and never never leave. Said abide with us for it is toward even and the day is far spent and he went in to tarry with them not only was they having a revival of commitment to his person but they were having a revival of comfort in his presence just him being there it was doing something they had left Jerusalem, felt all alone. I know I've seen the halos pop out on your head. I know you're more spiritual than I am. But I've been in some dark times and I felt like I was all alone. Late on July the 8th of this year, I was fishing with the preacher I was going to preach for the next morning. We was putting the boat. We was going back in to put the boat on the trailer, go home for the night. And if, you ever, if you're a real fisherman, you don't leave from over there and put it on the trailer. You stop and hit that spot, and you hit that spot. Then you put it on the trailer. So we stopped to hit that spot. I got fooled on where my bait was and jerked as hard as I could jerk. Think about getting shot in the eyeball with a musket. Or think about David slinging uh, a quarter ounce weight, five sixteenths ounce weight, out of his sling and hitting you right in the eyeball. Immediately, I thought my eyeball had exploded in 250 pieces. I, got to, I found out I was tougher than I thought it was because it didn't knock me down. I didn't go to screaming or crying. It did roll me back, and I bent over, and I said, Preacher, I blinded myself. He said, What happened? I said, The bait's hit me right now. I come look at it. And he run back there. It was dark. He ran back there and turned the light on. He said, I can't tell. Because I thought I just had a hole in my head by then. And he looked. He said, I can't tell. It swole shut already. Hadn't been 30 seconds. So he, uh, I gathered all my stuff up, got it all together. He put the boat on the trailer. I got out of the boat on my own power. I got in the truck on my, uh, my own power. I was up in the truck trying to get enough light to look, but it was so swollen, I couldn't see it. So he said, I'm going to run you down here at the hospital. Well, I thought he was taking me to a hospital. He took me to a 
a low end veterinarian clinic. <laughs> it had a hospital road on the front of it, but let me just tell you, it ain't no hospital. Well, I'll just tell you this. It's around midnight on a Saturday night. In the emergency room. Wasn't nobody there. I don't know how to do it up here. But every pill head in my town where I live is in the merch room on a Saturday night, Friday and Saturday night. Somebody's in there drunk and got in a wreck or fight or cut or beat up or shot. Somebody, wasn't nobody in this hospital. I, if I, I wasn't thinking right. I'll be honest, I was kind of in shock. I wasn't thinking right because if I'd been thinking right, I'd just turn around and walk back out told that preacher, can you run me to a real hospital? I didn't know I was 50 miles from the University of Tennessee. If you're ever in Tennessee, need to go hospital, you tease your bet, die on the way over there. Don't go to that one in Morristown, uh, Jefferson County or whatever. It Don't go over there. I hope they hear this. That rascal looked in my eye, called me straight back. Of course, that's after I fumbled around, got my ID out, made sure they had my mailing address. He looked in my eye and said, ooh, that's bad. Well, I didn't need no medical degree to tell you that. I was one guy hit with it. I knew that. I could feel it without even seeing that it was bad. And then he looked me dead in the... This eye was watering so bad I couldn't hardly open. He said, sir, I'm sorry. There ain't nothing I can do for you. He said, well, I'm going to call UT and get you transferred over there. They're going to have to operate on you. I said, when are you going to do it? He said, I'm going to do it now. $1,744 is the bill he sent me for that. They put me on the most uncomfortable gurney you ever laid on in your life. No pillow, no blanket. No pain pill, no pain shot, no IV, no nothing. Rolled me into a room and closed the door. Didn't even tell me where the bathroom was. They hooked me up to that thing, blood pressure cup, and that thing, you know, you put on the end of the finger. She went out in about 15 minutes, that thing started beeping. So I fumbled around there and pushed her. Let me tell you what your friends will do when you can't see. When they find out, now this was on over the next morning, not during the night, the next morning. When they found out, you know what they'll do? They'll text you. I can't even see my phone. Much less see a text. But anyway, they, uh, they put that thing on me. It got the beep and I messed around there and found the nurse. I was so close to the nurse's desk, I could hear the it beep, beep, beep. And then I'd hear it out there at the desk. Boom, boom, boom. Beep, 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 boom, boom. I heard them cut it off. I said, well, they'll be in here in a minute. About 15 minutes now. I'm going to just be honest with you. I was a little bit ill. I wasn't in excruciating pain, thanks to the Lord. But I, have you ever had that nagging pain? Like if my wife had walked in, I'd say, don't talk to me right now. Just, just stand there. Don't put your hands on me. Because she didn't want to come in and baby me. Don't baby. That's why I didn't call her. Don't baby me. Just let me be. Let me swell up. Be mad at everybody for a minute. Well, I, I, I waited about 15 minutes. They didn't come. So I just got up, unwrapped that tape, took it off, hung it over the monitor, pulled that blood pressure cup off, hung it over the monitor, reached down there and pulled it out of the wall, cut it off, unplugged it. Didn't nobody come in and check on it? Didn't nobody come in and check on it? I call it no see you. They push you in a room and no see you. I was going berserk. A thousand different scenarios was running through my mind. How you gonna, God blessed you with that big old vehicle and now you ain't gonna be able to drive it. Ain't nobody gonna wanna drive you around. Nobody gonna wanna. I had to preach six weeks with a patch over my eye like a pirate. I found out, praise God, preachers don't care. <laughs> they don't care. Come on, wear a motorcycle helmet. We don't care. Let's come preach. Praise God. But all them different scenarios was going through my mind. I was in shock. It had sprinkled rain. I didn't have a rain suit. And I was, had gotten a little wet. And now I'm cold. I don't have a blanket. I'm, I'm, I, I mean, I, it's dark. And I mean literally dark. Because this eye swole shut. And this one's watering so bad. I, can't, I was laid around two weeks with my eyes closed. My wife said, what can I do for you? I said, pull Matlock up on Prime. <laughs> Y'all know Matlock? She said, well, you can't watch it. I said, I've seen them so many times. I can listen to it. I can, feel, I can see it in my mind what's going on. But I can't sit here in the quiet. Anyway, I get back where we were. I was in that room, and I was going nuts. I was hurting. I was crazy as thoughts was going through my mind. And I said, Lord, I ain't got anybody but you. 
and I got to have you now. He said, son, I was with you in the boat. I was with you in the ride over here. I got out and walked in with you. When nobody else walked in, he said, I walked in with you. But I wasn't just walking in with you. I was standing at the desk waiting on you to get there. He said, I've been back here in the highway waiting on you to get here, and I was with you. And I began to feel that he was, I'm not saved by feelings. But I'm glad, thank God, when God gets kicking around in a room, I promise you, you'll feel it. I not only believed he was there, I knew he was there. And you know what happened? It seemed like the pain didn't go away, but it became more manageable. It seemed like that, I, I'm telling you, I was so mad I could have bit a ten penny nail in half and spit out a barbed wire fence. But I began to ease, and God began to work in my heart, and God began for six hours, just me and the Lord in that room. I, I wasn't doing much talking, but I was a listening. Believe it or not, I wasn't doing much talking. He is a doing all the talking. By the time they got me to UT, I, I told him I said put it down I don't want a, a prescription drug pill I don't need a Tylenol I don't want a morphine shot I don't want any of that don't give me I don't need any of that if I'd have walked in that surgeon said sir we got to cut the left side of your face off I'd said cut it off praise God cause something happened uh, in that room when nobody else was in there when nobody else cared uh, when the folks that cared didn't know uh, God didn't come in that room and say listen I'll get you settled and I got to run over here and then I know hallelujah he I had his undivided attention he came in and tarried with me he never left uh, he was with me all the way he stayed with me and I found comfort in his presence Amen. that night as I lay there I couldn't do much but God gave me a scripture out of that Bible that's all I got that book and I reached up, I literally laying on that gurney. I reached up with my right hand and I said, Lord, I'm holding on to that little phrase in that verse. And then a song started. And I reached, you know, he'll give you songs in the night. The psalmist said, he is, the Lord is my song. I reached up and grabbed that little phrase. Don't worry, I ain't gonna sing it. If my wife was here, I'd get her to sing it for me, but she's not here tonight, maybe tomorrow night, but I'd hold that phrase. And every time, now let me just tell you, I'm not so sure I'm as important enough for Satan himself to be after me, but I do feel like every once in a while I felt a little lion walking around in there and he'd roar. Oh, you'll never be able to see. Nobody will ever have you preach. You'll never be able to travel. They're not gonna call you as a pastor and you're blind and I'd hear him roar. I'd reach up and I'd say, Lord, all I got is Hebrews 13, 6. Uh, the Lord is my helper. And I'd reach over and say, Lord, by your grace, uh, I'd hold that song. I'm not gonna sing it, but it, that phrase goes like this. Uh, Safely this far. Jesus has brought me. There's no need to doubt him now. So every time I'd feel the wheel start to wobble, I'd say the Lord out loud. I hope they heard me. The Lord is my helper and I'll not doubt him now. He's brought me this far. I'll not doubt him now. And by the time that six hours was over, I'd found comfort in his presence. He did more for me by just standing in that room that night than he probably has in my whole Christian life. Thanks. I needed that. A revival of the comfort that's found in his presence. Our prayer tonight ought to be abide with us. Thanks. I needed that. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for the truth of the word of God and the power of the Holy Ghost. Now may we do business with God. And I pray Lord, abide with us. In Jesus' name, Pastor, you come. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.